Okay. Hello and welcome to NOAA's National Ocean Service Science Seminar Series. My name is Tracy Gill. Today and, and through all Tuesdays through May 28th, I am co-hosting a series with Dr. Gianni Shretta, Director of the U.S. Carbon Cycle Science Program Office. And Gianni will introduce the seminar series and speakers. But before she does, here are some logistics and related information. If you are not on the weekly NOAA Science Seminar email list but you would like to be, please email me at tracy.gill at noaa.gov and I will be happy to add you to the list. Folks in the room, please sign in and silence your phones. And if you have questions today, go ahead and type them into the chat box and the presenters will get to them when they can. And if you are interested in getting a PDF copy or video of today's presentation, please contact me, tracygill at noaa.gov or Yami Shretta, and our emails are both in the are in the chat box, and we'll be happy to send you a copy. And now I will hand it over to Giami, uh, who will introduce the speakers and the presentation. Giami? Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Giami Shrestha. I am the director of the U.S. Carbon Cycle Science Program Office and co-host of this webinar series with Tracy Gale from NOAA. Today's seminar is the fourth in a three-month seminar series titled from science to solutions, the state of the carbon cycle focused on communicating the second state of the carbon cycle report or SOCA2 findings in relation to current and broader societal impact and solutions. This series is sponsored by the U.S. Carbon Cycle Science Program in partnership with NOAA. For those who don't know about the U.S. Carbon Cycle Science Program, we are a 20-year-old interagency partnership established to coordinate and facilitate federal activities relevant to carbon cycle science with the science community. We led the development of the State of the Carbon Cycle Report, or SOCA2, which is a decadal assessment with over 200 experts from the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. Tracy Gill and I are co-coordinators of this seminar series. Please contact us if you have questions. Our presenters today are Grant John Keyes, a research scientist and group leader uh, from USDA Forest Service, Timber Products Output, and uh, Randy Kolkas, research soil scientist, USDA Forest Service, Northern Research Station. They are um, the, se the seminar title is, is entitled Recent Trends, Drivers, and Projections of Carbon Cycle in Forest and Wetland Soils Across North America. So there will be two separate talks from both speakers. Both Grant and Randy are, are chapter leads of the State of the Carbon Cycle Report. They led separate author teams with their respective colleagues, Chris Williams and Carl Chessin. Uh, Tracy Gill uh, will provide uh, um, a broader introduction on both speakers. Okay, here's a little background on Grant. Grant Donkey is a research scientist and group leader for timber product output and carbon science and reporting in the forest inventory and analysis program within the USDA Forest Service. Donkey studies how carbon is cycled through forest ecosystems and harvested wood products in the U.S using strategic level forest inventory data and auxiliary information. Grant and his team are responsible for compiling estimates of greenhouse gas emissions and removals in forests each year as part of the U.S.'s commitment to the U.N. Uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change. Grant has served as a lead author on several national and international reports, including the recently released Second State of the Carbon Cycle Report and the Fourth National Climate Assessment, as well as the forthcoming 2019 refinement to the 2016 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Guidelines for National Greenhouse Gas, Greenhouse Gas Inventory. And Randy Kolka holds a BS degree in soil science from the University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point and MS and PH degrees in soil science from the University of Minnesota. Following the completion of his PhD in 1996, uh, Randy was a postdoctoral research soil scientist with the USDA Forest Service's Southern Research Station on the Savannah River site in South Carolina. In 1998, he became Assistant Professor of Forest Hydrology and Watershed Management in the Department of Forestry at the University of Kentucky. In 2002, Randy became Team Leader and Research Soil Scientist with the USDA Forest Service's Northern Research Station in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. In this position, 
Rainey currently leads a team of scientists, graduate students, and postdocs conducting research on the cycling of water, carbon, nutrients, and mercury at the plot to watershed scale in urban, agricultural, forested, wetland, and aquatic ecosystems across the globe. Randy is an adjunct faculty member at six universities and public, has published over 200 scientific art, articles in his career. So welcome Grant and Randy, Randy, and thanks so much for presenting at the NOAA Science Seminar today. Take it away. Thanks very much, Tracy. Uh, this is Grant. Can you hear me all right? Okay, well, um, uh, thanks again for the opportunity. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Um, first, I'd like to thank NOAA for hosting this seminar series and for inviting us to share some of the findings from the Forest and Terrestrial Wetlands chapters of the recently released Soccer 2. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the co-lead on the Forest chapter, Chris Williams at Clark University, as well as the many contributing authors on the chapter. Um, you know, I had a good, the good fortune of working with, uh, I think, close to 20 scientists on the forest chapter and, and at this point really I'm only the mouthpiece for all of their fine work on uh, an effort that took more than two years to complete. So really proud of this project and humbled to have worked with so many fine scientists on the, the chapter. So um, I guess the only other thing I would say to start is I apologize for the aspect um, uh, of the presentation. Hopefully you can just bear with us as we work through this, um, this issue uh, in Adobe Connect. Um, so, now first I'd like to establish some context for these talks, and I think they're relevant for both the forest chapter as well as the terrestrial wetlands chapter and, and Soccer 2 more broadly. Um, for those that haven't dug into Soccer 2, the major focus of this report is North America with an emphasis on the United States. We're really focused on the scientific understanding and development um, in the decade since the first Soccer report, which um, went through the year 2005 and was published in 2007. And so, um, at least for the forest chapter, we really focused on that EPO between 2005 and 2015. And so, the results and presentations that I'll be sharing today, or, or uh, uh, graphics that I'll be sharing today, reflect that period. So, um, carbon uh, cycle processes, stocks and flux, as well as interactions with global scale bu budgets and climate change impacts in managed and unmanaged systems are really the focus of this report and was the focus of the original soccer. Um, and this really focuses on the status of and emerging opportunities for improving both measurements, uh, observations, as well as um, uh, informing uh, and facilitating projections of carbon stocks and fluxes um, and it also includes uncertainty identification. So in cases where um, you see asterisks next to um, uh, values estimates throughout this um, presentation, those really reflect either a quantitative assessment of the uncertainty or an expert judgment where a quantitative uh, assessment was not possible of um, the uncertainty associated with, um, with the estimates presented. Okay, so um, a bit more context. So uh, this map illustrates the uh, biomass density in forests across the North American continent. And as you can see, um, forests are widespread, uh, transcontinentally distributed across Canada up into the mountains uh, of Alaska, all the way down into the mountains of Mexico into the Yucatan. And so obviously across that latitudinal gradient, um, there's quite a diversity of forest types and that uh, carbon density is distributed um, uh, you know, relative to the activities occurring in those areas, um, but also are driven in large part by um, the climate, uh, topography, and other things related to um, uh, the geographic location of the forests as they're distributed across North America. So, um, you can see here in this table, uh, it summarizes the forest land area as well as woodland area, so perennial um, woody species um, that don't meet that cover or height definition of forest. We thought it important to include those um, in this table and in the chapter more broadly as they uh, include many of the same uh, or, or similar functions to forests 
Um, I'm not sure who's changing that, but if we can avoid changing that, it'd be helpful. Um, uh, so here we show both 2005, so really um, uh, the end or the, uh, the point at which soccer won um, was wrapping up, so that first decade of the carbon cycle assessment, and then more recently, the estimates of forest land area in the year 2015. And so you can see here that forest area has increased overall. Uh, there's been a modest increase, and that increase has really been driven by reforestation and in some cases afforestation activities in the United States because you can see that there was a, a relatively minor um, loss of forest land area um, in both Mexico and Canada over that 10-year uh, period. So the forest carbon stocks across these um, three countries, you can see here we've uh, broken them out by country and also by ecosystem pool. And so um, not surprisingly, given the similar land areas in Canada and the United States, the carbon stocks are quite similar, whereas in Mexico, which doesn't have the same uh, land area for it, uh, is also a major component. So total, we're looking at uh, more than 26,000 teragrams of carbon um, in the above ground component. And I'll just highlight that um, soils really dominate the majority of uh, the soil carbon stocks, the soil storage, or the carbon storage in forests in North America are really dominated by, by soils, particularly in those cool, wet um, uh, locations like interior Alaska, um, but also the, the boreal regions where there are deep, rich peat soils. So um, now on to the key findings for this chapter. So we identified five key findings, and, and this really serves as the outline for the rest of my presentation. So. Um, uh, just briefly, I'll highlight these findings. So first, forests in North America are a net carbon sink, although those, that, that sink um, and, and where the uh, uptake is occurring uh, is distributed, distributed differently across the North American continent. Forest regrowth is a really critical component of this carbon sink and maintaining that carbon sink um, over the last decade um, uh, of analysis. The annual harvest removals have decreased forest carbon stocks, but are also balanced or, or more or less balanced by post-harvest recovery and, and regrowth in these um, lands that have been actively managed. Um, there are re the recent trends suggest that some disturbance rates have diminished um, the sink strength of, of the forest across North America. Um, and then finally, uh, the sink strength in North American forests are expected to continue to decline over the coming decades. And that's really driven in part by the age class distribution of forests. There are some bubbles there. Um, uh, so forests are aging. But also uh, disturbance dynamics and patterns um, uh, are also a contributing factor to the uh, uh, predicted uh, decline in this uh, sink over the coming decades. So um, before we get into key finding number one, this box and arrow diagram illustrates the carbon emissions and uptake from the atmosphere, as well as transfers between land use categories. So up to this point, we've laid the groundwork. We've described sort of the forest land area, as well as the woodland areas across the continent, um, as well as carbon stocks. Now we're going to really start to focus on um, the interaction with the atmosphere and stock changes, um, both uh, transfers to and from land use categories, uh, as well as um, sequestration, or, or photosynthesis um, absorbing carbon or, or contributing to uh, the accumulation of carbon uh, in live vegetation, as well as the decomposition um, or combustion of dead organic, live or dead organic matter um, uh, in the case of wildfires. And so this, this uh, diagram really illustrates, I think, simply um, the complexity of the land sector and some of the interactions, transfers, um, with both the atmosphere but also other land use categories. And this was really a driving figure um, throughout and, and sort of a, a simple diagram that we used throughout this chapter to really um, highlight uh, stock changes but also how disturbance, land change, and other factors were contributing to um, the, the carbon sink and the sink strength um, moving forward. So to dig in a little bit deeper, um, uh, this uh, table uh, describes, again, across each of the three countries included in this analysis, the uh, uh, emissions and removals of carbon 
uh, in, in teragrams of carbon per year. So this is, these values really reflect, or estimates really reflect an average um, over that 10-year period um, in Canada, the United States, and Mexico. And so you can see here um, that the net uptake uh, is 217 teragrams of carbon per year um, by the forest sector in North America. And this is fairly well documented and as reflected by the um, relatively um, uh, high uncertainty or low uncertainty values reflected in that um, uh, the bottom of the table there associated with the 217 teragram. Um, the strength of the net uh, carbon uptake really varies regionally um, with about 80% of the North, North American carbon sink occurring in the United States, as you can see here. So key finding number two, uh, forest regrowth following historical clearing plays a really critical role in determining the size of the forest carbon sink. But there, there are studies out there that also suggest a sizable contribution from growth enhancements um, such as carbon dioxide fertilization, nitrogen deposition, or climate trends supporting accelerated growth um, in many regions of the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. That being said, resolving these different factors or, or potential contributors to growth enhancement um, is a major challenge and remains a, a critical gap and important area for future research um, to develop reliable predictions. Key finding number three, so forest regrowth following historical clearing has really played a substantial role in determining the size of the forest carbon sink. Um, but studies also suggest that um, in a lot of cases, um, this uptake uh, based on um, uh, these disturbances are, are quite important for um, uh, maintaining the, the, the carbon sink and maintaining carbon stocks across that carbon sink. So disturbances, particularly in the southeastern United States and parts of Canada, have really led to losses in overall carbon stocks, but the uh, regrowth following uh, those harvests are, are an important contributor to sort of balancing some of those losses. And as you can see here in the next slide, um, there are opportunities to increase this carbon uptake. And so while uh, harvest removals have really contributed in many cases to a loss of carbon, uh, particularly if, that, uh, if, if those trees are being used in short-lived uh, wood products where the carbon is released back to the atmosphere in a relatively short amount of time. There are, there is hope and there is, are, are many opportunities out there, um, uh, particularly um, forest management activities that accelerate growth after disturbances. And a lot of these forest management activities, as you can read in the chapter, also align really well with other management objectives. And so um, multiple objective forestry is obviously um, an important part of a lot of um, agencies' efforts, as well as private land management. And so carbon is but one of those objectives, but, but nicely aligns with many of the other objectives, whether it be forest management, wildlife habitat, et cetera. Um, there are al also opportunities to expand forest land area through afforestation and or reforestation activities, as well as to target understocked forest stands to maximize the potential of carbon sequestration and accumulation on those sites. So uh, a recent analysis, particularly on national forest land, suggests that there's great potential to restock understock stands as well as um, address or, or restock non-stock stands that are either the result of um, recent harvesting activities or um, major disturbance. Now to the key findings four and five. Um, key finding number four, um, so these, these two illustrations describe sort of um, uh, spatially explicit estimates of disturbance dynamics both in Canada and the United States, and I think this really highlights some of the advances that have happened since the first soccer report. Um, the leveraging auxiliary information, remotely sensed data has allowed us to better characterize um, uh, forest disturbances. And, and, and those data products and the underlying estimates have been useful in national level reporting and increasingly are being used to distill um, these national estimates into finer resolution analyses that can inform states and, and sub-provincial uh, 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 governments as well as um, entity level analyses 
And that's really, I think, um, uh, a, a reason for optimism moving forward in this space is there's a lot of work to refine these estimates, provide more spatially explicit uh, estimates, as well as spatially continuous values to improve reporting across scales. And then finally, um, well, there have been uh, uh, losses as a result of uh, forest disturbances. Um, in many cases, um, uh, the losses are, are sort of uh, balanced out uh, by gains and regrowth. But um, you can see here, uh, there are a couple culprits, particularly in Canada, bulk hill and wildfire, and also in the western United States. Um, recent uh, um, uh, pests, as well as wildfires, have contributed substantially to losses in both carbon stock, but also sequestration potential uh, in these areas, which is an important uh, uh, element in terms of evaluating um, projections and also management activities um, uh, to maybe reduce or avoid these emissions and also um, uh, maintain sequestration at a high level. Um, finally, uh, key finding number five was focused around the fact that there are many different drivers um, uh, of the things driving the carbon sink in North American forests. And um, while we continue to be a carbon sink across the, the continent, um, things like natural disturbance um, could decrease or further decrease um, uh, uh, this sink over time. And um, uh, other things like, uh, again, like I mentioned earlier on, the uh, uh, age class distribution of forests. We have an aging forest land base, particularly in the United States. And so um, forest management can help, help offset some of those uh, uh, that, that reduce sink. Um, there are some other opportunities as well. Um, so substitution and avoided conversion. Um, so using or directing um, uh, uh, harvested wood products to long-lived wood products. And so not just dimensional lumber, but also um, tall timber structural support. You can see here, um, the top illustration here is um, uh, uh, one, of the t uh, one of the top floors on a, a University of British Columbia dormitory. This building is almost entirely made out of wood. And so um, uh, structural lumber uh, that can be used for tall building buildings to replace um, uh, fossil fuel intensive um, uh, building products like concrete uh, are a great way to store that carbon for long periods of time and directing some of those um, harvested wood products towards these long-lived wood products and identifying new markets to use this material is, uh, is, is one way that we can avoid um, uh, emissions uh, and also substitute um, for, for uh, fossil fuel intensive uh, products. The same can be said for the utilization of forest harvest residues for energy. Um, where we can uh, replace coal um, and or other um, uh, uh, carbon expensive um, uh, energy sources with uh, harvest residues. Um, it makes sense in, in some regions um, and also helps with uh, energy security in some cases. There's also um, opportunities to avoid deforestation. Um, and I think this is a big one. In, in many cases, uh, just maintaining forest land Maybe there aren't opportunities to increase sequestration on sites, but avoiding deforestation, maintaining the accumulated carbon on those sites um, uh, uh, that may have been accumulating for decades, centuries, or in some cases millennia, um, is one way to um, maintain that carbon sink um, over time. And then finally, again, through management activities, we can man manage fuels to reduce emissions from fires, um, uh, as well as capture some of that carbon that may otherwise be lost. And, and use that for um, to replace fossil fuel intensive uh, fuel sources uh, or fossil um, uh, carbon rich fuel sources and or use in um, long lived wood products. So data and analytical needs for decision support. So um, there are a variety of things that um, are needed to improve sort of the state of the carbon cycle at this point. Um, some of those things include improving a map uh, or in other words spatial and temporal characterizations of things like site productivity, stand age, management and disturbance histories, as well as current structure or, or biomass maps. And, and a sort of extension of this is not just those static products, but increasingly we need products that allow us to detect 
or you know, in a rigorous way, evaluate change in these different attributes or variables on the landscape. Um, other, other elements, um, uh, uh, life cycle assessments of substitution of some of these long-lived wood products um, for uh, fossil intensive or, or carbon rich um, uh, energy or building materials are really necessary to evaluate um, just how much substitution um, uh, benefits the, uh, uh, or, or can contribute to offsetting um, some of the emissions and uh, avoiding some of those emissions. Some other areas for improvement are, are areas where we need to increase or improve our understanding. So broadly speaking, carbon dynamics associated with land conversion. Um, so uh, this is sort of an area that we haven't focused on uh, um, all that much uh, in recent decades. We've really focused on individual land sectors, but we know that there's a tremendous amount of land change going on. And so doing a better job of documenting, first of all, where those land changes are occurring, and then um, uh, uh, observing how those land changes are, are contributing to changes in the carbon dynamics on those, uh, uh, those lands is really important and particularly uh, for below ground processes, uh, soil carbon processes um, is really important. Um, also uh, determinants of forest recovery post disturbance. So what are the drivers of, of, um, of those forests regenerating in a timely way? and contributing to that uh, to sequestration and accumulation of carbon versus um, uh, respiration and, and loss of carbon from those systems, um, as well as uh, documenting uh, forest responses to rising CO2, climate trends, and, and also uh, variability in weather patterns and climate over time. Um, uh, we need a better characterization of climate forcing from the for, uh, for, of forest change, so not just carbon, but some of the other uh, species and, and, and all the uh, different uh, gases that contribute to um, uh, uh, forcing and potentially uh, feedback associated with forest change. And then finally here, um, we need to do a better job uh, of attributing changes uh, across the land sector, but particularly in forests, to specific drivers. This will allow us to better inform policies, identify what's driving these changes on the landscape, um, and also inform management practices now uh, or future activities um, going forward. So in conclusion for the forest chapter, um, we've come a long way since the, the first day of the carbon cycle. Um, forests in North America remain a net carbon sink, but the sink strength has, has declined um, in recent years and is projected to continue to decline for some of the reasons just mentioned. Um, that said, there are opportunities to maintain and enhance the contribution of forests um, and offsetting and reducing emissions, both in terms of um, enhancing uh, um, regrowth and forest growth uh, on some sites, and that makes sense in certain regions of North America, and in other cases, just avoiding deforestation or loss due to um, wildfire and other disturbance activities. Um, that represents um, another important alternative uh, in cases where sequestration may not necessarily be high, but where those forests may store a tremendous amount of carbon. And finally, um, uh, uh, this, this certainly, um, this report was uh, uh, a really uh, valuable experience to sort of um, compile all of this useful information, but one of the things that became pretty clear pretty early on was that we have a lot to learn and improvements are necessary to really capture at fine spatial scales what's going on across the North American continent as it relates to the carbon cycle and forests. So with that, um, again, I would just like to um, thank my, my co-author, co co-lead author, Chris Williams, as well as the many contributing authors, um, as, along with the, the science team, Rich Birdsey, um, uh, Gami, um, uh, Nancy Cavallaro, and others that contributed to uh, uh, to this chapter and uh, I guess the overall soccer community. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think we'll all have a question until the end so that we can make sure that we can hear what you need to say. Winnie, you want to go ahead? Hello, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Should I just go ahead? 
Yes, please. Okay. Well, thanks again as well for uh, having this opportunity to talk to everyone. Um, so our team of folks, and it always takes a huge team for these things, but we had a great team of folks, and uh, we did uh, an assessment of terrestrial wetlands, which is Chapter 13 of the second report. I was just going through the list of folks, and I do see at least one co-author is on the phone today on the webinar, Brian Tangen uh, from USGS, so I'm glad Brian's along today as well. And I can move this myself, right? Yeah, okay. And so uh, before we get into the soccer results, I wanted to give a little background on wetlands, what they are, why they're important. Um, the definition of wetlands uh, from USDA is it has to have water-loving vegetation, hydrophytic vegetation, a waterlogged soil or hydric soil, and saturated soils near the surface during the growing season. And of course, those three things interact to really affect um, the amount of carbon stocks in the soils um, by wetland type, the climate veg, and uh, hydrogeomorphic setting, which is actually runs up the page there a little bit. Um, in the background there is our um, large uh, climate change experiment up in northern Minnesota called the spruce, or spruce and peeling responses that are changing environments experiment. Where we have these huge chambers and we're looking at changes in temperature at five different intervals of temperature both above and below, and below ground. Um, and that's mixed with two different levels of carbon dioxide and we're getting some really neat results uh, that's a bog in northern Minnesota. It's about two and a half meters deep, the peak in the bog. And uh, down at the bottom, it's about 12,000 years old since we uh, had our last glacial period up here. So um, believe it or not, that two and a half meters of peat is mainly derived from the sphagnum, the moss that's been growing on it for all that time, not so much the trees and the shrubs. So the smallest plant is actually the one that's maybe most important from a soil carbon sequestration point of view in these systems. Scroll. Is there a way to scroll? Okay. So in our assessment, we looked at both organic soils and mineral soil wetlands. Um, again, we looked at the definition mainly by the USDA, but we looked at some of the Canadian definitions and whatnot as well. Um, so organic soils include peatlands. Organic soils and peatlands are relatively synonymous. Um, and they include a couple of different kinds of peatlands, bogs and fens. Um, they're in the soil order histosols, and they have greater than 18% organic carbon in the upper 40 centimeters. Again, that's the USDA definition of organic soils. Mineral soils don't meet that definition, but they still have hydric soils and uh, water-loving plants. Um, some examples of these. And not all cases, in all, not all wetlands in all cases are one or the other, but curry potholes and, and marshes and black ash wetlands are pretty common type of these wetlands. And the picture there, you can't see it too well, but that's a black ash wetland. And we have some studies going on looking at um, girdling those black ash trees to simulate the impending invasion of emerald ash borer in this part of the world in the Great Lakes and the Northeast as well, the United States. Um, Many, uh, in many of the soil orders, they're at the wet end of mollusols and alphasols and septosols, so they cross orders, whereas organic soils are pretty much only in the histosol order, if you're a soil taxonomy geek like I am. And then uh, less than 18% organic in the upper 40 centimeters, so it doesn't meet that organic C criteria in that upper part of the soil. Uh, talk a little bit about some of their functions before we go on to the report. Important carbon sinks, uh, important for hydrology and water quality, and important habitat for some plants and other in, plants and other crit and critters. This is a the picture there is a white cedar wetland, and if you look down in the sort of the surface water, you can see it's very brown to black, very high in dissolved organic carbon. Similar for many types of wetlands. One of the neat stats that throw around a lot is uh, peatlands on the planet. So this is just North America, but on the planet they're about 3% of the threshold area, but they host 30% of the soil carbon. So really disproportionately important as far as soil carbon goes. Um, that soil carbon has been built up because of that balance there between decomposition and production. 
And uh, over the last 12,000 years, however long the peatlands are, or mountains are, production has outpaced decomposition, mainly as a result of water tables being near the surface. Uh, question is, is this starting to change? And there's some suggestion that there is. Um, there's lots of studies indicate, well, it's continue to be sinks for sea, but like Grant said about forests, that sink may be becoming less over time. And there's actually been a few studies that have shown that wetlands have flipped and become sources. We have an eddy covariance in an open wetland here in northern Minnesota. And in 2011, it flipped that year. Our, the annual balance flipped from being a sink to a source, and it was because we had a really, really warm fall period. And so the microbes keep decomposing even though the plants are senescing. So as we get longer shoulder seasons, springs and summers, that could lead to more flipping from being sources to I mean, thinks the sources are, or even lesser sources would be really important to know. They're sort of the kidneys of our landscape. They both purify water, slow it down, um, so we don't get quite as high of peak flows um, on the left. And like I said, they collect sediment and nutrients and whatnot. And water coming in usually is much more fluid than water going out. So again, they're really important from that point of view. And uh, again, Important habitat for critters and other endangered plants. Um, some wood frogs and wood turtles and deer really like the empty yard in the winter. That chickadee is a boreal chickadee and uh, comes down here in northern Minnesota and it spends its pretty much its entire life cycle in peatlands. As a matter of fact, it makes a nest out of the out of the sphagnum moss. So again, some 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 animals are really dependent upon these ecosystems. So that gives a bit of a primer. Um, so what our chapter um, was about, wetlands. And so the scope of our chapter includes the contrarian United States and Alaska, um, Alaska, Mexico, and Puerto Rico. We also did Hawaii, but the numbers are so small that we did report them in the, in the main tables. Um, the, the numbers for Mexico and Puerto Rico are also very small. Um, what's included is terrestrial, terrestrial freshwater wetlands. What's not included are all those other things. Um, tidal, tidal systems, open water body, Arctic wetlands, um, converted or um, constructed wetlands are not included either. And you can see on the distribution of that map of North America where the distribution of wetlands is. It's really much in the north and along the eastern coast. And this is just a little plug for, for Ray. Um, next week's uh, talk actually combines a number of these chapters. Um, Ray and others have taken the numbers from my cha our, our chapter and the forestry chapter and the marine chapters and whatnot and put them all into sort of how the landscape level fluxes of carbon work across North America. So a little plug for Ray for next week. So uh, I should mention Carl Trenton. He is our, the lead co-author with me, and he did a lot of this work with his colleagues as far as developing a whole new set of a series of calculations based on data that was collected since the Soccer 1 report. And in this case, in Soccer 2, we broke the carbon stocks in the soil down to the mineral versus organic soils and forested versus non-forested. So we got four different ecosystems we evaluated mineral forested, mineral non-forested, organic forested, and organic non-forested. We incorporated new assessments of wetland area in Mexico, Canada, and Alaska, um, incorporated sea stock inventories where feasible, and we used emission factors from the literature and also from the, some of the latest IPCC documentation on, on wetlands. These are the sort of the databases that Carl used to uh, and his colleagues used for this new information. So our chapter was pretty different than all others in that we actually started down from scratch and did a whole new evaluation based on the new information that has resulted from the last Soccer 1 report. And the ones with the red stars there are ones that, um, not that say they didn't exist, but they had a much, quite a few updates since 2006, 2007. So that's all relatively new information that we use for this chapter. Let's see. 
So getting a little hard to read here, but um, uh, North America contains about 37% of the global wetland area. Um, Non-forested wetlands comp comprise 44% of the area, mostly in Canada, Alaska. Organic soils comprise 58. So forested wetlands would be the opposite of that, obviously 56%. And mineral soil wetlands would be the opposite of organic soil, so 42% of the area. Thank you for squeezing that in for me, whoever did that. 67% um, of the area in Canada, or uh, 67% of the total area of North America is Canadian wetlands, um, mainly peat forests, or a big fraction of them. 32% is in the U.S. and Canada, or the continental U.S. and, Can and uh, I'm sorry, Alaska. Um, with non-forest mineral wetlands being the greatest. Um, so. so somehow in this process I lost like three slides. I'm not sure what happened there, Tracy. I was afraid when I saw the total number of slides, it seemed like it was too small, but um, I'll continue here uh, despite that. So there wasn't going to be another side of distribution of, in the continental uh, U.S. of peatlands. The lake states, the northeast, the southeast are by far the areas with the most density of peatlands. They also had quite a bit of mineral wetlands, but mineral wetlands definitely are also more common as you get west of of in, in the western part of the U.S., especially the Dakotas, Montana, um, Washington, Oregon. So mineral soil wetlands more common in the west, organic soil wetlands more common in the lake states, the northeast, and the southeast. Um, the stocks, let's see here. So these stocks in this diagram are in um, teragrams, and so it gives you the range of stocks in teragrams, um, and this is all of North America. Um, you can see where the water tables are a little different in the peatlands. They really have a little higher water table than the mineral soil wetlands. Um, you can see that the soil stocks are an order of magnitude bigger than the vegetation stocks. Again, the soil carbon um, storage in these ecosystems is immense. You can also see that um, at times, just about all wetlands are sources of methane. Um, there's a, not a negative methane uh, number there as far as fluxes. Um, so generally all these sources of, of methane, but generally just about always sinks for CO2, although there are some positive values of CO2 as well across the range of the literature that we found. Um, and then overall, uh, about 16 teragrams leave these ecosystems in the form of dissolved organic carbon. Again, these are big mass balances that have quite a bit of air in both of them. And so you put all those things together and you get the sort of the, the net balance. And so, um, so this is annually. They sequester in North, again, this is all North America, about 126 teragrams of carbon a year. But then there are emissions for about 44.8 teragrams of methane as in the form of carbon. And you do have that DOC leaching of 16. So about 65 teragrams of carbon per year is the net balance of wetlands. They are still a huge sink compared to other ecosystems. So just to sort of reiterate the key findings here again, they comprise about 30% of the global wetland area, the wetlands of North America. Uh, the rate of wetland loss is much lower than historical rates. Um, we have about 53% of the wetland areas with, with loss from when we settled to about 1980. Um, in the Midwest, the losses are huge because of agricultural conversion and in California, both because of the cultural, agricultural conversion, about 85% in the Midwest and about 95% in California. Thankfully, we've been being a little more careful since the 80s and 90s, and we've only lost about 0.06% from 2004 to 2009. And some would even show that we've gained wetland area because of wetland restoration and creation of um, work. Um, a lot of uncertainty about the functional equivalence of these wetlands. Um, restored wetlands and, un and disturbed wetlands, they don't have the same functions that natural wetlands do. 
EPA did a survey and they found that 48% of wetlands were in good condition across the U.S. This is U.S. only. 20% in fair and 32% in poor condition. And at least part of the issue is wetlands tend to be disturbed on the edges or their, or their perimeters and that really affects the water and nutrient balances of the entire ecosystem. And so that's one of the things they just keep getting chipped away, chipped away, chipped away at that ultimately the, the ecosystem will start to fail. Uh, terrestrial wetlands in North America contain about 36% of the global wetland carbon stock. Um, that's quite a chunk of carbon. Peatlands contain about 50% of the total area, but about 80% of the carbon. Um, so peatlands, again, really disproportionately important from a carbon storage point of view. And forested peatlands comprise about 55% of the area. So more forested than non-forested. Sea fluxes from terrestrial wetlands, again, they're sinks for carbon dioxide, but sources of methane, and they're also sources of DOC. Again, about 65 teragrams of carbon a year are being sequestered in North American wetlands. A lot of uncertainty around that, like, like many other things here. One of the things that wetlands are not very well representative is in models, especially the global circulation models. So it's really important to be able to get some idea on, on sort of the processes going on in, in wetland systems, both forested and non-forested. Not only the stocks, which are important, but even more so, I think, the fluxes of methane and CO2 and other greenhouse gases like, like uh, NO2 and whatnot. And so an extra need here from a wetland point of view is we really need to get better model, uh, better model wetland carbon cycles and apply these to these global circulation model, where in some cases they're not even present as a land use type. And then a few differences from Soccer 1 because of these new analyses. Um, Soccer 1 wetlands chapter by Scott Bridgham and others included all wetlands. Um, again, we only included freshwater wetlands in their case. There's 320,000 kilometers more freshwater wetlands than what was in Soccer 1. 50% uh, though less in Alaska, and that's because mainly I think because the permafrost is now in the Arctic chapter, which was considered in our, the Soccer 1 chapter. Uh, but we found, because of these new analysis in Canada, quite a few larger areas, mainly resulting from mineral soil wetlands in Canada, 619,000 kilometers more wetland area in Canada. Our results suggest a higher sequestration than in uh, what was reported in 2006. And uh, but we also have much higher methane emissions that were reported in 2006. So kind of a balance there, one going one direction, one going the other. And that's all I have, Tracy. Um, again, thanks for Nancy and Gami and all the folks that helped us. Um, there's some contact information there if you have any questions. Thank, Thank you. you, Randy. And I apologize for the technical problems we had today. You guys really hung in there, and I appreciate it. And so do we have any questions? Folks on the line, we can have questions for Grant or Randy. Please type your questions into the chat box. So Randy, I have a question for you. I, I, I think it was you, or maybe it was Grant, but how do wetlands become sources rather than sinks? Do, does increase in temperature cause them to be more of a source? Yeah, it probably works the same for both types of ecosystems, but certainly increasing temperature. And I mentioned one example, especially on the corner um, months or the corner seasons, but we call them the, the springs and the falls. Like in northern Minnesota, our growing season is about 21 days or three weeks longer than it was in 1960. And so as you get these longer growing seasons, the plant community adapts, certainly, but also the microbial community adapts. And when you have alterations in that, where you have like a really warm fall, was the example I used, the plants are senesced already, but the microbes are still kicking and they're still um, putting out CO2 and methane. So, as these shoulder seasons or these edge seasons start to expand, I think we're going to see both in wetlands and in forests, um, maybe lesser sinks or maybe even flips to be in sources. Grant? Okay. Yeah, I would agree with that, Randy. That's exactly right. As these uh, 
as these sort of marginal seasons, particularly in the northern latitudes, um, become longer and, and, and tree species and, and other live vegetation, um, senescence for the season, sequestration more or less stops, respiration continues and emissions continue. So I, I would agree with that. Okay, folks, any other questions? And as you can see in the chat, you can download all these chapters. You can download this. Uh, a video will be available in a few days of this presentation. Uh, the PDFs will be available. Um, so you can download all of this. And if you have any questions, we have about nine more minutes. Feel free to uh, type your question into the chat. Thanks. Sometimes it takes people a few minutes just to formulate their questions, Grant and Randy. Okay. So next week, Ray's going to be talking about more of the, um, the tidal wetlands, right? He'll be talking about carbon cycling in North America's land, ocean, aquatic continuum. So he'll be talking about the, strictly about the tidal wetlands then? No, he, uh, I think he's going to be talking about the connections all the way from the wetlands all the way to the tidal communities through lakes oh. and rivers and then all the way Oh, okay. The Boy, that's big. Well, thanks. Yeah, yes. So he's, inter he's integrating three or four chapters. Okay. That's, that's correct. And, uh, and he's, um, he, the leads from the other chapters will also be on that call to answer questions if needed. Okay, well, I don't see any questions coming up, so if you have questions, now's your chance. Hi, Tracy, this is Grant. I just got a, a side note from a participant on the, apparently the um, chat pod is not available for um, participants to type in questions. Really? Okay, let's start. Let me see what's wrong with that. Sorry. Hold on. Yeah, let me work on that. Let me see what I can do. Uh, share. It's showing that it's shared. Um, hold on, everybody. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, geez. Okay. Uh, hold on. What I'm going to do is clear the chat and see if I can... So if um, attendees would like to try a chat, could you give it a try, try a question? I'm sorry about all the trouble we're having today. My apologies. Well, I'm so sorry. I don't know what the problem is. I'm kind of learning Adobe Connect myself, and I can't seem to figure out how to make it available to presenters. So I guess we'll have to end this now. And um, I want to thank Randy and uh, Grant for participating, and I'm so sorry about the technical problems. And we'll see you next week on March 19th, and hopefully I'll have everything figured out. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Thank, thank you. you.